Greetings, Earthlings. <laughs> I feel like we should start a day of celebration by doing something celebratory, which is taking a selfie. So if I could ask everyone to stand up for a second and stretch, and while we're doing that, I'm going to queue up my phone to take the Bates College commencement selfie. Does that sound good? All right, let's do that. All right, let's see if this works. Okay. Very good, you all looked great. I'm gonna put that on Twitter later. If you don't wanna be on Twitter, let me know now. I'll blur out your face. Thank you so much, President Spencer. It is such an honor to be part of Bates's 156th commencement and join you, the faculty, the staff, the parents, and the random old people who come to these things <laughs> as we celebrate the accomplishments of the class of 2022. Especially this year, the first normal commencement ceremony since 2019. I don't know what happened during those intervening years. Some guy must have suggested that you change things around. What a jerk. <laughs> also very grateful, President Spencer, that you and the Board of Trustees have chosen to award me a Doctor of Science degree. That is extremely meaningful, and I'm very excited to start putting that to use. <laughs> it's also such a pleasure to share the stage today with the other Bates honorands whom you just heard about. Now, graduates, none of you will remember this speech, which frankly takes a lot of pressure off of me. <laughs> the thing is, we all like to think that we got here on our own. But in reality, none of us gets to where we are on our own. When I graduated from college, I thought I had it all figured out. I was independent. I was a one-man wolf pack. But the truth is, I was basically a house cat, <laughs> completely dependent on others, yet fully convinced of my own independence. <laughs> we all have someone here today who helped us along the way. So I wanna take a moment to recognize the parents and family members of the graduates who are here today. A big round of applause for them. Graduates, I ask that you also thank them for supporting you for the past four years. And also remember that comm commencements are a lot like weddings. They go on for a long time, but they're pretty much for your family. <laughs> now, many parents in the audience today, especially if they're not residents of Maine, are looking at me right now wondering the same thing. Who is this guy? <laughs> Why is he here? Was the travel budget for commencement speakers cut? <laughs> the best they could do is a guy from down the street? Well, just remember, if you like what I have to say today, my name is Nirav Shah. If you don't like what I have to say today, just remember that my name is Sanjay Gupta. <laughs> Many months ago, when President Spencer asked me to deliver this year's commencement address, I pledged that I would take the honor seriously and commit to the careful craft of writing a speech in the same manner that many of the graduates committed to your senior thesis or your capstone project. So, last night, After downing a bunch of Red Bulls and literally reaching the end of Twitter, I started writing. I looked at the list of prior Bates commencement speakers. Coretta Scott King, may she rest in peace. Former Maine Senator Margaret Chase Smith, may she rest in peace. Anti-apartheid leader Bishop Desmond Tutu, May he rest in peace. <laughs> Renowned physicist Freeman Dyson, may he rest in peace. 
civil rights icon, the representative John Lewis. May he rest in peace. When I looked at that list, my first thought was, man, why do all the preceding Bates commencement speakers end up dead? <laughs> what is up with that? There is an uncanny correlation between speaking at the Bates commencement and then dying 30 to 50 years later. <laughs> I need to have an epidemiologist at the main CDC look at this because if there's one thing I've learned during the pandemic, it's that correlation always equals causation. <laughs> now it's, <clears throat> it's very meaningful being here with everyone today. It was three years ago, almost to the day, that my father died. He had a progressive illness, so his death, while painful, <clears throat> was not unexpected. I think he would have liked Maine. The mountains, the ocean, the solitude. One of my regrets is that he never got to see Maine, and he never got to know the Maine that my family and I have come to know, to love. He would have enjoyed being here today, too. Seeing all of you graduate, hearing me speak with you, it would have made him proud. Just like many of you, my dad came a long way. He went from picking mangoes in rural India to medical school. When he came to the US in the 1970s, he worked as a busboy at the Gold Coin Restaurant in Chicago while he studied for his exams. And on the day he passed his exams, he walked into work and sat down at a table. His boss barked at him and asked him why he wasn't working. My dad replied proudly that he was a doctor now and he wanted a cup of coffee. <clears throat> One of my life's privileges was to spend the last five months of his life with him and my mother down in Houston, Texas. And one day, while driving back from a medical appointment, my dad and I were stuck in traffic. And above us was a burned out old railway bridge over the interstate. And on that bridge, there was graffiti. It wasn't just everyday graffiti, though. It was graffiti with meaning. There, on the rusted metal, someone had spray painted two words. The two words that were elegant in their simplicity, compelling in their directness, and poetic in their brevity. Two words that struck me and have stuck with me and that I've spent the last three years thinking about. Be someone. Be someone. That's it. Two words that capture how my dad lived his life, how I try to live my life, and how today I'd like, you to ur I'd like to urge you how to live your own lives. Now, like any good poetry, as Ms. Giovanni could tell us, the phrase admits many interpretations. Are you supposed to be someone? Are you supposed to be someone? Today, I offer you three ways that my father exemplified those words through humility, through humanity, and through humor. Let's start with humility, which is at the heart of being someone. For me, humility comes down to saying the three hardest words in the English language. I don't know. The thing is, I used to think that being intelligent, being someone, involved having all the answers. Not just some of the answers, all of the answers. This had a few implications. It led me to think that intelligence came from accumulating the largest warehouse of knowledge, of minutia, of trivia. For me, being smart, for being someone, was like having the only pin at a balloon party. An achievement consisted of walking around, 
popping everyone else's balloons. Frankly, this approach led me to being tremendously unlikable. <laughs> I really should have changed my middle name to, well, actually. <laughs> the thing is, and what I've learned, is that in the face of a global pandemic, no one has a monopoly on knowledge or expertise. And yet, so many are so reluctant to say that they just don't know the answer to something. Instead, they just talk. Please, graduates, don't do that. If someone asks you what time it is, do not tell them how to build a clock. If you don't know what time it is, just tell them that. The second quality of being someone that my father exemplified was humanity. I always marveled at his ability to communicate with people who had an entirely different worldview from him. Rather than dismissing those who asked him skeptical questions, he treated them with humanity. COVID has brought the challenges of misinformation to the forefront. And when we think about things like life-saving vaccines, the stakes are literally life and death. But here's the problem. We often treat skeptics like a high school debater would. We rattle off a litany of reasons why they're wrong, and we try to pop as many of their balloons as possible with our pen. The thing is, in the history of recorded thought, not a single mind has ever been changed via that approach. Even worse, we sometimes condescend those who question whether COVID-19 vaccines are effective. We treat those with different beliefs not just as incorrect, but as ignorant. And we wrongly dehumanize them and anyone who doesn't see the world our way. Graduates, please, don't do that. I've been asked numerous times how I know that the COVID-19 vaccines are effective. After all, I didn't perform the studies myself. So how can I know that the vaccines are doing their job? Well, rather than overwhelming the skeptic with a bunch of journal articles or dismissing them outright, I'm honest with them. I know that the vaccines work because I am part of a chain of trust with the people who have concluded so. Scientists, physicians, statisticians. I trust the ultimate conclusion because I trust each of the links in the chain. But skeptics are often part of a different chain of trust. A trust, a chain whose links comprise lived experiences and relationships, not necessarily data published in scientific journals. And those skeptics are susceptible to misinformation because they don't belong to the same chain of trust that scientists, that many of us do. So what to do about this? Well, the first, is don't dehumanize those who disagree. Rather, recognize that their skepticism may stem from being part of a different chain of trust. And second, be someone. Be someone who builds trust. Ask them why they believe what they do and what evidence might change their mind. The thing is this, trust happens one conversation at a time. It's like a bank account. And you have to make multiple deposits into the account before you can start making withdrawals. Now, as my dad saw it, the third quality of being someone was humor. It's a quality he kept with him through the end. He learned his English language sense of humor from an old TV show called MASH, something your parents probably watched. Watch. Here, here, yes. Applause for MASH. In fact, I was just chatting with my team about my favorite scene from MASH, describing war. I urge everyone to take a look at that. But MASH was a show about an army field hospital during the Korean War. And I admired my dad's ability to bring humor into situations where I would, I would have least expected to find it. Even in the room of a dying and suffering patient, and their family. My dad always found a way to lighten the heaviest of moods. That's important because you are allowed to laugh. 
These days, humor is considered fraught in some circles. The world is dark, and there are those who suggest that a well-timed joke is not always appropriate. I don't see it that way. Indeed, it's just the opposite. We need the levity that humor brings. Laughter during dark days doesn't diminish the weight of the shadows. It just makes them a little bit easier to bear. And that's because the human brain is a magnificent thing. We can be happy and sad at the same time. You can hold joy and grief in your hands at the exact same moment. Humor is what makes us human. And humor is important, especially now. When I think about each of you, you all came into consciousness while the world was still reeling from the attacks of 9-11, into a world punctuated by terrorism, unending gun violence, economic recessions, environmental catastrophe, and now a global pandemic. Tom Brokaw hailed the people who survived the Depression in World War II as the greatest generation, not for who they were, but for what they overcame. Now, I don't know what your generation will be called, but one thing is clear. The world has handed you much more than your share. Your generation has seen so much and responded with wit and creativity, righteous anger, and a determination to take the reality you've been given and make it better. Even, though co even through COVID, you managed to flourish under absurd circumstances. For many of you, junior year abroad turned into junior year abridged. A lot of that's my fault, sorry about that. <laughs> but your humility, your humanity, and your humor have helped you be someone who is about to graduate from Bates College. Now many of you will go on to remarkable careers in business, arts, and government. The rest of you will become podcasters. <laughs> but no matter where you go, what you do, you are likely to be one of the smartest people in any room that you're in. So the first thing you should do is find a bigger room. But the second thing is to remember the tools that Bates has given you. Bates has prepared you to choose to be anyone, any time, in any place. But my ask of you is far simpler, that you choose to be someone. Choose to carry the qualities of humility, of humanity, and humor with you wherever you go next. Congratulations to the Bates College class of 2022. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for honoring me today. Thank you for humoring today. Go out there and be someone. Thank you.